Before we have a few minutes of discussion, can I just ask for a show of hands, who would volunteer for a Zika challenge study? Hands up. And who would really rather not? That was pretty, this is about as equipoise as you can get on this question. 50-50. <laughs> okay, so I think we'll go straight on. Just have a few minutes discussion before the breakout group. Uh, questions for Ricardo and, in fact, uh, also for Dorcas and Mariel. Uh, we might as well just go straight on to the general discussion. Thank you. Uh, that was a really nice uh, talk. So uh, questions for the entire panel, but mostly for uh, Ricardo. So when we're looking at things like challenge studies, which are obviously very challenging um, for ethical approval, one of the things that we have to really look at very, very carefully is uh, risk-reward ratio and understanding the risk and consent, um, well-informed consent for uh, potential participants. And I'm guessing that uh, the reason that uh, the panel determined that uh, human challenge studies with Zika aren't going to happen at this current time uh, is because we know so little about the Zika virus. So you can't really give potential participants much information to make a decision, an informed decision about whether or not to participate. Uh, and so I wouldn't participate simply because there's so much we don't know about Zika at this time. Uh, is that, is my assumption correct in that, uh, that's incorrect, okay. Um, so maybe you could s explain more why the panel decided that uh, human challenge studies aren't a good idea, but then also maybe address this, my question about we don't have the information to really give people to make a decision. Uh, thank you for your question because, yeah, it's, it's, it's sometimes uh, there is some misunderstanding about what uh, happened. In terms of the risk, to the direct risk to for the volunteers, we didn't get any major concern. We are absolutely aware that most of the infections by Zika are asymptomatic. The risk of having a serious, uh, you know, symptom or condition like Guillain-Barré syndrome is really, really low. It's 2.4 out of 10,000 infections. And you can treat it very quickly and without no sequels if it's an early detection. So we rapidly reached this conclusion. And, and, the, and if I can, uh, you allow me to make the point is because the literature is biased because most of the reports of the symptomatology and clinical features of Zika came from the US. So uh, the people that get uh, uh, look for medical attention in the US are the most severe cases, but we had millions of people without noting, nobody noticing what is it. So it's really, really much. So why we uh, decide not to move forward? Because the risk for bystanders was not clear at this moment. So we didn't have any enough information to control the risk for bystanders. And the second issue that was uh, considered was be because we didn't get how the social value in terms of the advancement for a new vaccine was being incorporated particularly by the regulatory agencies. So these w th those points were the main reason because we decided we don't have information, but the main one is risk for bystanders. Next question. very much. Uh, this is a question for anyone on the panel. I wonder if you could speak a little more to the potential reputational risks for um, sponsors of research and the research enterprise in general. I'm thinking of the situation in which uh, we carry out a challenge study in uh, a low resource set setting and then for reasons that may or may not be related to the challenge, someone dies. Um, and the possibility then that that is associated with 
uh, the research being conducted. Because the headlines are very easy to imagine, right? Sort of write themselves. You infected someone with typhoid, then they died. And the nuance of, well, actually, the probability of them dying from typhoid that we gave them in this study was really, really small, and we gave, you know, gave them all the information, et cetera, et cetera. That's liable to get lost. So I'm really worried not about the actual risks of the research, but the interpretation of what might happen if there were such a serious adverse event. So I'd love to hear your views about that. Sorry to see it just behind the, the gentleman in the white shirt. Now. Um, so my, I have a point to make. Um, why? So wait, let me just articulate it nicely. So about the serious adverse events and about the quality of trials in LMICs versus high-income countries, they should be the same whether it's a challenge study or other studies. So I just want to make that point. You know when. You know, it, this shouldn't be a something special. So the facility should be there. Um, the S A E reporting should be there. The quality of the care should be there as well. Is my opinion. And the other point is that um, we, I mean, sure we're talking about L M I C. And why are we talking about L M I C when um, in, in this session? It's because um, challenge studies have been conducted in high income countries, but now we're doing it in, uh, we're thinking about doing it in LMICs. But I think the question should be um, rather than LMICs, because in LMICs you have very literate and uh, privileged people, and in high income settings you also have poor people. I think the vulnerability question should come into play more than high income versus low income settings. With relevance to that point, yeah. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, it, it, we can just follow up he, he, here in the front, as it's a, as it's uh, relevant to Peg Hong's point. Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to come back to Ricardo's point and uh, the previous question when he was pointing out that there wasn't so much risks for participants, but to by standards, by standards, and uh, we might think, for example, in ways of minimizing that, for example, hospitalization, uh, ways of trying to. But what I was thinking was that uh, <coughs> the response the, the team gave was maybe more related to political response, uh, a, a political response, and it, it has to do with the culture, but not with the, the culture of uh, the, the people, but the culture in bioethics in Latin America, which is quite protectionist, 
and uh, a kind of team uh, proposal might erase many uh, um, like um, furious voices on how can we doing things like that a little bit as what was so it's not so much the the problem that the trial per se might pose, but the uh, the way that, for example, many bioethicists in Latin America think about research and the protectionism there is very very uh, inside the the way of handling these issues. Is it that that was on the back? No, <laughs> I think, I, I, I'm saying no to everybody. Uh, well, uh, actually, this uh, this um, panel was covered by NIH. Uh, we have three people from Latin America. Uh, none of them will have a you know, the background in ethics, uh, what we are called because of our scientific expertise. I would say the we three were more in favor to do the challenge. Um, the ones who put the position, more, the more conservative position came from the US and Canada. And, uh, and the reason for, for that is was mainly because um, they, they never don't know how this risk, this potential risk for the bystanders it would be worth if we don't know if the uh, knowledge would be useful to uh, speed up the process of the vaccine. It was like uh, that, and, and there are very f and a lot of noise. I would say that there are a lot of scientific journal papers that were published with um, uh, incomplete information that create noise. I would, uh, as, as for example, the duration of uh, the virus in semen. So there is a lot of papers that say, are saying, ah, we found the virus six months later. But what, if you read very carefully the paper, they have the genetic parts of the virus, but they don't have a live virus. But it creates noise. So that's part of we and the scientific background, as we publish a lot of things, we create noise in this issue, in this emergency. And this is something that we need to acknowledge. Over here. Yeah. I, I have a question for Ricardo. Um, so from my understanding, uh, Zika is, is, is mostly prevalent in uh, pregnant women and, and, and infants. And we know traditionally that pregnant women have been excluded in clinical trials. So I was just wondering, are there any peculiar ethical issues that you think might be associated with doing these Zika challenge studies in pregnant women? And could there be a different approach maybe that can be adopted to, I don't know, attract uh, many pregnant women to participate in these Zika challenge studies? And um, another question that I had was for um, the typhoid challenge studies in uh, um, maybe African countries. So my question is, do, do, is there responsibilities uh, on the part of sponsors to address other sort of unmet uh, or unexpected ethical issues that might arise when conducting these uh, um, challenge studies in uh, African countries? For instance, with regards to typhoid, we know that it's spread through you know, contaminated water and there's lots of sewages and un, uh, lack of access to uh, safe drinking water in African countries, for instance, in my country, do researchers have any obligations to address, you know, uh, some of those, you know, practical challenges on the ground, which might not be related to the, you know, actual research question that you're trying to address? That's my question. And yes, when we discuss a lot about uh, the risk of pregnancy in the, in and what would happen. One of the issues was, okay, if the person who volunteers is a, a male and he get a sexual relationship with several people and you can't control who is having sex with this guy, probably this guy can infect somebody that is pregnant. So when is the, is the point of the bystander? So we think that infecting a male volunteer could be more risky because it's 
how to control. So one of the, uh, uh, they, they mentioned, okay, let's choose a man having sex with men, but how can we assure that, I don't know, this person decide to have sexual relations with, with the lady? It could happen. So it's, it's very difficult. So the other option was, okay, let's try with women. So women, in general, you can assure that you can control the pregnancy because we have very effective methods for contraception. So it could be a good idea. But the problem is that the virus stay for longer than in the blood. So we know that the virus can stay in some tissues like the kidney. And so we do the test in, in blood and we don't find the virus. But the virus could remain in other tissues. And if it remains, it can infect a, a woman that was volunteered later on. So how long is this time after the challenge that this lady was like clear to get pregnant? So this is a question that we don't have at this moment. We have some ideas, probably three to six months, but we don't have at this moment. But in general, we think that women would be the best uh, volunteers for this kind of trial because you can control contraception. Um, so just to answer the question about, um, so can I just clarify what the question was? So um, is the sponsor responsible for ethical issues that arise during the trial? And then I think there was a separate point about um, sort of being responsible for infrastructure, sanitation, that sort of. Okay, so I think um, firstly you'd say that it's it's um, kind of the principal investigator and the research team's responsibility to kind of like sound out the practical issues before um, a model is going to be um, introduced or trialed. Um, thinking about like the practical sanitation aspects, I mean, we've discussed the possibility of having like an inpatient setting, although that's not very practical for typhoid because you're talking about a six-week period between infecting somebody and being sure that they're clear from stool clearance samples. Um, if you're thinking about, I mean, there, there has been a little bit of, you know, you talk about um, instead of sort of, you know, if you're thinking about how much you might spend on a challenge study in the UK, it's going to be a lot of money. Um, if proportionate reimbursement is less, in, in an alternative, like a low or middle income country, could you justify spending the money that you would have spent, like investing it in infrastructure, investing it, um, you know, I, I think the hostel idea is quite an interesting one, you know, would you actually like invest in a hostel that has a better sanitation um, system so that you're actually protecting the community it might be actually a good solution. Um, my question goes to Dorcas and Merilla, I think uh, a little bit builds on from my previous question. I mean, um, it seems that you know there is you both, I think, including even UK study, alluded, you alluded that there is compensation, which somehow motivated you know your uh, subjects to be involved with the recruiting. Particularly, that is the case, maybe particularly in the Kenyan case. And my question is, how informed is informed consent? When people are so much interested and when there is so much undue pressure for money, regardless of risk, regardless of understanding objectives of the study and risks and all that, so how informed is informed consent when there is so much pressure to get you know, the money? Uh, that's why, that, why, that's one, one question. And another one is perhaps, I'm not a clinician and uh, maybe sorry for my maybe ignorance, uh, you end up recruiting, because of this you know, compensation, you end up recruiting people from marginalized you know, racial minorities and uh, ethnic minorities and those who are jobless and all that. And would that be also, how does it affect maybe the, the whole, the science of uh, even vaccine development? You know, these people are not representative. They, they have developed maybe immunity to all kinds of adverse situations because of their living conditions. So how is that also reflected in the, just, you know, the vaccine development itself if you are not you know, getting representative people from uh, uh, different walks of life? Okay, so just to answer the first question, that's about um, how can you give informed consent if you're um, receiving money to participate in study? Um, 
So it's it's quite interesting. You kind of develop it a bit of a gut instinct for this, but um, it can be really obvious when somebody's very financially motivated. Um, for example, you pick up the phone to do the telephone screening, and the first question is, well, "How much money am I going to get paid?" You know, it's actually it does. You know, you get a you get a feeling for like what is really motivating someone, and I think in those instances you go through things. Even you know, you go through things in detail with everyone, obviously, but you know, you go through even more. Um, you emphasize the risks more, probably, um, because you're getting a feeling that, that somebody is actually not maybe motivated by the altruistic motivation. Um, the second point was about the different study populations, whether that compromises scientifically your outcomes and endpoints. Um, so actually, we exclude, we have quite strict inclusion and exclusion criteria and um, you're excluded if you've been resident in an endemic country for more than six months, um, excluded if you've had a previous um, typhoid vaccine, and excluded if you have um, a high um, anti-typhoid capsule antibody. If you, yeah. So basically what we're trying to do then is actually establish like quite a naive population. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, a comment, the comment, I guess, follows quite nicely on from that. So I try to be a comment rather than open things up even more. But um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm a bit less worried about the compensation. Than, uh, you've, so you've both given evidence of people, in your case, a market trader selling clothes, carefully thinking through, you know, the economics of this and making a decision to participate. I, for many years, have taught medical students in Oxford and asked them, about this, and they seem to be working out for themselves whether this is something they want to do. So, so I'm not as worried about that, but I am a little bit worried about the potential for a market in medical research in this space. Um, and I'm not quite, quite sure what I think about my own comment now, but it seems a bit worrying to me that, particularly given what Joe was said earlier about the potential risks here, the reputational risks, you've got a market trader in Kilifi deciding, you know, is this good for me? And you've got medical students in Oxford. Um, and and the, the amounts of funding, the, the amounts available are hugely different in those two places. And I, uh, elsewhere in medical research, I don't, when you talk about, if you talk about reimbursement, then I think that doesn't matter quite as much. But where people are clearly making financial calculations, I'm not sure necessarily I want, would want the same amount of money to be paid in Oxford and Kalifi, but I do worry about it being quite so different. There's an equity school. issue there, isn't there? Uh, uh, do you still want to say something? Okay. Um, the 
did uh, Ricardo did I see your hand went up when we had a show of hands about who would be participating well okay so if we go back to the first 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 slide that we saw in this this meeting it was about having a fair off about whether uh, 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 teams would be a fair offer for partici parti participants, for potential participants. So it seems that you agree that it'd be a fair offer, that you know the risks very well from a scientific perspective. You have lived in an, in, you live in a country where uh, uh, Zika has been endemic, and you, as I would as well, are willing to participate. So I really do not under, I mean, the, the analysis uh, uh, of the, the conclusion of this report, it seems to me that the ethicists are not understanding the risks. And the more you expand on this and the more I read it, it looks like, like oh, we fear there's something completely unknown would, would result from Zika. And I think that part of our job should be to bring some rigor to this discussion. Because if we start thinking about this crazy unknowns, this science fiction type of risks, then we will stop doing any, risk, uh, any uh, uh, research. Yeah, you know, I, I, when I was invited to this panel, I did an informal survey to some of my fellow infectious disease colleagues in Brazil from several states. I called about 10 of my colleagues and I questioned, would you participate yourself in a, ch a human challenge study for Zika? Nine answered yes without any doubt. Only one raised a doubt. He was probably already infected. He, huh? was, he was probably already seropositive. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but well, uh, let, uh, me, let me just uh, justify a little bit. So what happened... I think we really need to... We're running really late now, okay. so the very final question over here. Uh, uh, maybe it's a follow-on, really, from uh, Mike's comments about um, the, some problems that have developed in the last uh, several years. So in France last year, uh, there were uh, deaths in a, a person human trial, and about 10 years ago, the TGN 1412 uh, trial um, in London. So you've got very well resourced locations that have had major problems. But I think what seems to be right, there, so there, there's risks, there's compensation, there's informed consent involved with all of those. But there seems to be a, a cluster of other factors that we've not really looked at, such as misinterpretation of basic uh, scientific inform information, um, the kind of pushing up the doses too quickly, not having enough infrastructure in place to respond to side effects. And so I'm wondering, have you thought about how would, a, I guess, a cluster of protections be put in place to ensure that uh, those sides of the whole new areas of research would be addressed as something somewhat potentially controversial like uh, Are you talking about Zika or anything? With, with any of these any that of have them. the potential yeah. to be... Does anybody want to make a very quick comment to finish the session off? Yeah. Mariel. Um, yeah, so I think I went through the safety. I mean, there's a very um, intensive safety provisions so if you're thinking about, you know, you're monitoring people on a daily basis, you're doing their blood tests on a daily basis, you're looking at the symptoms on a daily basis, blood pressure, pulse, all of those things, um, you're really keeping a very close eye on people for deterioration, and you have access to all the backups that you need, like clinically in the hospital. Does that answer your question? It has to be very explicit. Uh, so uh, we, we've really overrun a lot, and that was... Kind of, it was going so well. It was kind of on purpose. We 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 think that uh, uh, the best thing to do now, because we've got the breakout group, is to go and get some coffee. Go to your breakout groups. Further discussion about this, and then back at uh, half tenish, uh, half elevenish, for the next session. So uh, that just leaves me to thank the panel again for marvelous case presentations and discussions. Thank you.